As Steve mentioned, I represent uh, well over 150 different auto dealers, uh, both in Florida. Uh, I also represent some in Ohio uh, and uh, Georgia as well. Uh, the idea here today was just to kind of go through the basic areas where I see car dealers um, getting hit with liability in my practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you may have been at the presentations this morning. There was some discussion about the, uh, the FTC and their stepped-up efforts. Uh, to regulate dealers. Uh, currently, they, well, currently in April, uh, they cracked down on some dealers for some advertising. And the advertising at issue uh, essentially disclosed that the dealers in question would pay off uh, any trade, which, while factually true, the FTC found to be misleading. And when the FTC looks at advertising for dealers, there's four factors that they look at. Uh, when determining whether your disclaimer or your fine print's permissible. The caveat to that is the FTC says there are certain things you can't do in an ad and then turn around and disclaim later on. And in fact, they believe the advertising issues fell into exactly that category. Because they said that if you look at an average person, uh, they read the ad that said that the dealership would pay off the trade no matter what you owed. The FTC said that a reasonable person wouldn't understand that in fact they're going to refinance the balance that's owed and have to pay it off through their own retail installment sales contract or similar document uh, with their new lender. So essentially they, they believed that the dealer should have disclosed in fact that the customer was paying off the trade, the dealer wasn't. And there was five or six different dealers that got hit with that. Now, you think to yourself, how doesn't somebody understand that the dealer's not going to pay off their trade? I mean, it's in the buyer's order, it's in the retail installment sales contract, uh, the FTC doesn't look at any of those documents when uh, assessing an advertisement. And in fact, they, they use the least sophisticated consumer standard in many instances. And if you think about, uh, it's a little scary because if you think about uh, the intelligence of an average American and figure about half of the population is less intelligent than that person, the FTC can very easily point out that uh, the ads that say, you know, you're going to pay off a trade or something like that can be misleading. Now, if you're going to try to use fine print or disclaimers, uh, there are four things that they look at. The first thing is prominence, and the FTC defines that as whether the qualifying information is prominent enough for consumers to notice it and read it or hear it. Uh, presentation, whether the qualifying information is presented in easy to understand language that does not contradict other things said in the ad and is presented at a time when consumers' attention is not distracted elsewhere. And you see that in a lot of the television ads. There's a little tiny fine print at the bottom that tells uh, you what you need to know regarding the entire advertisement that just went on. Um, the FTC is going to take a hard look at that. And if it's not on the screen for a certain amount of time or the type is so small that you can't possibly read it, uh, it's going to be a problem. Placement. Placement is also something they look at. And that, they define placement as whether the qualifying information is located in a place and conveyed in a format that consumers will read or hear and understand. And then the last thing they look at is proximity. And that's whether the qualifying information is located in close proximity to the claim being qualified. So if you have, if you have a newspaper ad and it says at the top, uh, you know, $1,000 for any trade, push it, pull it, you know, get it in the door, and then way down at the bottom in little tiny type, away from that broad headline, you've got, a, you've got your qualifying language uh, that's one of the factors that the FTC will look at. Now, the next area after your advertising, um, and, and this is my overview on, on, on liability you can take down by finding customers. Um, leads. Leads are a big area uh, where dealers take down a lot of liability. And the way that I see liability um, coming in on leads is really in two areas. One, you hire a sales guy and he comes with his customer list. And his customer, he's been in the business for eight or ten years, worked up the street or worked at a couple different dealers in town, and he's got a list of people. And he says, look, I sell these guys cars, I keep track of it, I've got their contact information in here, uh, everything's good. Well, not necessarily. That customer list is technically the dealership you used to work at's customer list. And you can find yourself in an action against a competing dealer uh, making a claim that the customer ran off with that customer list. More importantly, you could be looking at liability to those customers. Uh, if the salesman improperly utilizes um, prohibited methods to contact them, uh, sends them texts, calls them on a cell phone that they don't have permission to call on on your behalf, 
your dealership can be liable under a couple of federal statutes that I'm going to get to uh, later on in the presentation. Um, but there could also be customers out there that are upset that their personal information is out there. Uh, you know, I've had, um, well, more than one occasion, but very recently, uh, we had a situation where a salesman left the dealership and a former um, purchaser of a car from that salesman got an email uh, from the salesman announcing that he was at a new store, uh, they had financing specials, and he put in there, I was unable to help you at my other dealership, um, and I guess these were his leads, these weren't his customers. I was unable to help you at my other dealership, uh, but now based on these new financing programs that I have at this dealership, I can help you. Well, that customer's furious because she said that the, um, our dealership, my client, that was the former employer of that salesman, allowed him to share the fact that she was turned down for credit at that dealership with a third party, his new employer, that he utilized information that she gave to that dealership as part of the sales process or the application process, her email address and other information. Apparently, she thought he had done some kind of an analysis uh, based on her income information and the other qualifying information she provided to dealership A over at dealership B to make the determination that she qualified uh, for their programs. And she was very upset. And she filed actually a claim. We got it stayed and compelled to arbitration. And the client ended up settling the claim. Well, immediately then, we made a claim against the other dealer. Uh, that dealership fired uh, the offending sales guy, and then we were left trying to chase him. So if you're going to take in uh, customers or uh, salesmen that come with their customer list, be aware of that. I also defended a trial. It was a week-long trial in, uh, in Florida over uh, referral fees. And uh, I represent a dealer that had a referral program uh, where they would pay uh, other dealers, sales guys, for referral fees for deals that they couldn't do. They were a subprime lender. They said, look, if you've got somebody that can't qualify, send them over to me. If they buy a car from us, we'll pay you 200 bucks, we'll pay you $250. Um, the competing dealership filed a lawsuit and won. And uh, we prevailed on six of the seven counts. Uh, it was a seven-day jury trial, as I said. The jury came back with a verdict finding um, for theft. And they said that the competing dealer committed an act of theft, essentially because the customers that they were paying, the referral fees they were paying for, didn't belong to the salesman. That was the other dealer's customers. And the jury couldn't get past the idea that this dealership was paying the salesman of this dealership for what it perceived to be this dealership's property. And it didn't matter uh, that that dealership couldn't finance those people. You know, we established they didn't do any subprime financing. Um, you know, the owner of that dealership testified uh, that though he considered those people to be his leads and, you know, six months down the road, maybe their credit situation improves, he could follow up with them. Um, and if anybody was getting paid for those leads, it should be him. He said, and it's my advertising, uh, it's my uh, hours of my employees that are generating this, this stack of leads and then they're being sent over there and my salesmen are reaping the benefits. So if you are paying referral fees, be careful because some states also have laws that restrict the ability to do that. Um, but my client never really viewed it as theft. They said they, they were just asking for something that the other dealership couldn't use. Essentially, um, you know, no different than somebody uh, taking a, a referral around Christmas time, you know, the hot new toy uh, that everybody's looking for. You can't find it at Walmart, and one of the Walmart employees says, go to Kmart. Um, you know, it was that simple was the way that they perceived it, but, um, you know, two years of litigation later, that wasn't the way it ultimately flushed out. Now, the, the thing that I mentioned a few minutes ago about contacting uh, former customers, uh, there's restrictions on both telemarketing and uh, texting. Uh, there's a couple of federal laws. There's the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which essentially prohibits the calling of a number issued by a cellular telephone company without the express consent of that, of that number's owner. And that's a problem because people change cell phones often. So if you've got a stack of information uh, that somebody brings from a different dealership or you've got an old leads list and you start following up with that, and uh, the prohibition's on an auto dialer, so if you're using an automated dialing system, that, that's where you run into the problems on, on the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. But by calling their cell number, and, and debt collection companies uh, run afoul of this provision all the time, uh, if any of you are using an auto dialer in your collections work, if any of you do buy here, pay here, be aware of it. Um, the, the scary thing about the definition of an auto dialer is a, a telephone device or a telephone communications device that has the capacity to store and uh, make calls, to store numbers and make calls. 
or a telephone system that randomly generates numbers. Well, I haven't seen the case yet, but my cell phone number can store about 5,000 numbers, and if I press a button, it'll make the call. This technically meets the definition of an auto dialer under the way the federal statute was drafted. That was drafted in the late 70s. So nobody conceived that you would have a phone in your hand that, that could make these kinds of calls, and then it's been augmented over time um, to, to compete with this, the, cell, um, the cell services that are out there. And the main reason the Congress said it was enacting it is because you shouldn't have to force a consumer uh, to pay minutes to get calls. The telemarketing sales rule is also a federal statute that can apply. You can't use um, an automated recording uh, to leave messages for customers without their express written consent. It has to be um, in a standalone agreement, and it can't be a condition of sale. So I know some dealers that roll out programs every now and then where they send out, uh, they can get numbers of their customers, they put them in a machine, and it spits out a pre-recorded message, you know, come down, we're doing a Fourth of July event. Um, unless you have the express consent of that customer to contact them in that way, you're in violation of the federal statute. So if, if any of you are, and, and there's a lot of companies that are promoting that because uh, my client said he can get all of the, uh, all of the cell numbers in a, in a Florida county for $250. Um, doesn't have any value because you can't call without the consent on an auto dialer, but if he's going to sit there and manually dial them, I guess he can. The second area where uh, dealers regularly take on liability, and this is a no-brainer, is during the negotiation process. And the hot button items right now, number one on my list um, is Carfax. I probably have 12 cases in my office that somehow touch on an issue with a Carfax. Um, the key factor that, that has yet to be determined by any court is who's responsible when Carfax is wrong. Of the 12 cases that I have, there's four um, where the Carfax was accurate at the time of the sale and then subsequently information arose uh, that the vehicle had been in an accident. And the theory every single time is, you gave me a misleading Carfax, you didn't do an adequate inspection of the vehicle, if any reasonable mechanic would have looked at this car, they would have understood that there's um, damage to it, that it's been repaired, or in fact, you've done some repairs to it. Uh, those, are the, those are the particularly bothersome ones when uh, my client has actually repaired the vehicle and presented the customer with a Carfax and said that there's no accidents showing on the Carfax. Um, you know, is that a representation? I think it is. I think it's actionable. Um, in, under Florida law, you can't make certain affirmative representations regarding the condition of a vehicle unless you've actually inspected it and determined that it's accurate. Um, if you're using Carfax in that way, it becomes a problem. Now, I have a, also an interesting case relating to eBay. And for a while, eBay was providing a free um, report on vehicles. They weren't using Carfax. I think they were using um, AutoCheck. And uh, it says eBay provides this report to you as a free service. And this is the exact situation. My client bought a wrecked vehicle from um, uh, an insurance company, completely rebuilt it, sold it on the internet on eBay. And eBay put an AutoCheck report on there. And the plaintiff's attorney is saying that my client allowed that report to be posted on there knowing that it was false and the consumers were going to rely on it. And, you know, I take the guy's, de and it was as is with all faults, you take the guy's deposition, he says, yeah, I read this uh, auto check. It says no accidents. It gave an 84 for the score. Um, you know, that one is going to be a difficult case to defend because their theory went from my client willfully committed fraud to my client allowed a false report to appear in its advertising. Um, I haven't gotten yet to depose AutoCheck to find out how often they update, you know, what their mechanisms are, who actually paid for that report. So there's a whole host of issues that, that we may use to try to get around it, but it's a very simple situation where if the dealer would have just disclosed in the advertisement its body that, in fact, it had been in an accident, the AutoCheck wouldn't have mattered. We talked about accident damage and disclosures for accidents. Um, nothing is a minor accident anymore because all of the reporting agencies don't differentiate. You know, they say frame damage, I guess, if it's bad. Um, but most of them just issue possible collision damage. Uh, you don't know if it's somebody sideswiped a, a pole going through an ATM or uh, somebody's, you know, been in a, in a severe accident. Was there a question back there? How do they determine what's minor? Yeah, that's a good question. 
only because I know where Carfax usually gets their information, some from insurance companies, some from Jiffy Lube, some from, um, you know, uh, body shops. I mean, they don't have complete information, number one, and, and I think that um, that's one of the uh, defenses to one of these claims is, look, you know, Carfax spends a lot of money on advertising trying to promote the fact that they've got this reliable system of uh, verifying whether a vehicle's accident damaged or not. It's just not the case. There's just not enough information. I mean, if somebody uh, repairs the car themselves, it's never going to make it. Or if their friend knows a body shop, it doesn't report it. It's just never going to make it into their system. Um, but I'd be interested to know if they have a dollar amount or if, you know, they're relying on police reports because, I, you know, I've seen Florida accident reports that say $3,000 worth of damage because the cop looked at it as a fender and the car ends up getting totaled because the frame was bent. Um, so if they've got a reliable source for it, it would be, it would be good. Uh, but if, they, if, if it's just, you know, they're going by whatever somebody's telling them what's minor, I think you're going to have an ambiguous standard that's going to differ across the board. Um, oh, yes. I actually have written, I have actually written a buyer's order. I, I had a client, he got sued, uh, didn't disclose accident damage, bad case. Uh, we settled it, he paid, he didn't want to settle it at first, but he ultimately ended up paying like $45,000 on a $20,000 card because he got attorney's fees and everything else. So he comes to me and he says, look, I need you to draft me a buyer's order. I said, fine. So I draft him this buyer's order and I put in there, this car has been in an accident. It has been repaired by somebody that may not be skilled at repairing vehicles. You have the right to take this car to anybody you want and have them inspect it, and we have set the price for this vehicle based on the fact that it has been in an accident and may have been repaired by somebody with no mechanical skill whatsoever. <laughs> so he says, nobody will ever sign that. I said, look, try it for three months. Tell me what you think. He says, nobody's ever questioned it. Everybody's read it. And the lawyer that sued him in the case that we paid $45,000, I have another case with her. She stopped me coming out of court the other day and said, I see you revised your client's buyer's order because somebody else went back to her to try to sue him. And she's not bringing the claim. She said, there's no way she can possibly claim that he didn't know the car was in an accident. <laughs> so I called him and I said, look, uh, you know, your little bit of money you spent on your buyer's order is going to go a long way. You didn't get sued on this. So um, having terms like that out there are helpful. Uh, there's, a, there's a very bad uh, Florida case recently uh, that says the retail installment sales contract had some language in it that said it was a fully integrated document. Uh, it's just a fancy way of saying that this is the entire agreement between the parties. And it's the standard Florida law contract and it says this contract represents the entire agreement with, between the parties with respect to this contract. And I don't even know what that means or who wrote that, but that's what it reads. And the court said because of that, uh, the dealer couldn't enforce a standalone arbitration agreement because the court said it appears that the parties, because the finance company in Florida is usually the dealer, uh, and then they either assign it to a third party or they hold it themselves, they were listed as the seller in the retail installment sales contract. The buyers were in there, and, they said, and the court said this appears to be a fully integrated contract. Therefore, all of the other documents that were signed at the same time of the retail installment sales contract are unenforceable. So they wouldn't enforce the arbitration clause. Now, I don't know if the judge has ever bought a car before or had any idea of the number of documents that you sign, but if you take that to its logical conclusion, if that customer bought a service contract, it's not enforceable. The service contract company can keep the money because it's a separate standalone agreement. It's not part of the retail installment sales contract. It doesn't apply. If there's a separate warranty from the dealer, I guess that's not enforceable either. Uh, the arbitration clause obviously is not enforceable. Your as is, your limitation of damages clauses that most people put in their buyer's order, all not enforceable under this you know, ruling. Um, if you've got an agreement with the customer and they give you a trade and they agree to pay off the trade, if there's any additional liens, it's not enforceable. It's not in your retail installment sales contract. So it's the only case that's been decided that way and it's one of those situations where you know, a court has taken 200 years of contract law and thrown it out the window because they didn't like what the facts of that case were. I see that a lot. There, there, there's a lot of times um, what I like to call, there, there's car dealer law, and then there's everybody else's contracts. You know, you can sell real estate as is, there's no liability, you can't orally alter the terms of an agreement for real estate, but if you're buying a car, oh, that's, you know, you can do that under unfair and deceptive trade practices or, you know, s similar statutes, you can throw all the contract law out the window uh, and bring claims because people bend over backwards to try to allow a plaintiff to have their day in court. Now, 
sales versus auctions. This is another area that I see um, increasing uh, regulation coming. Uh, the FTC attempted uh, to regulate online auctions the last time was in 2003. Um, it's going to come back with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau stuff. The reason being there's this paper out there that the FTC authored in 2003 that talked about how online auctions present uh, high instances of fraud. And they differentiated online auctions from your typical auctions where it's brick and mortar and you can look at the car, you can touch it, you can see it, um, and felt that based on uh, the way that eBay is set up, those things don't exist and those things don't happen. Um, based on those issues, uh, the FTC is going to come back. They're absolutely going to come back and they're going to try to regulate auctions. And if you think about it, um, you know, if you're selling cars on, uh, through an online auction, whose terms govern? Is it a Florida deal? Is it an Ohio deal? Is it an auction? Um, because if it's a traditional auction, there are very specific rules regarding auctions. And it's as is. You know, the buyer's buying it with all faults. They understand. Thank you. Based on the fact that it is an auction, um, that there may be problems with the vehicle, there may be problems with title. Um, all of those things, if you look at cases regarding auctions of cattle, and you look at cases regarding auctions of real estate, all of those types of cases say that in an auction situation, it's essentially all bets are off. I mean, it, it's, an, it's a momentary sale. There's no negotiation. There's no bargain for exchange. It's I will sell this particular thing to the highest bidder, as it is, where it is, and with all faults. And for whatever reason, the FTC is saying that shouldn't apply to vehicles. Now, eBay tweaked some of their, um, some of their deals uh, based on, in part on the FTC. Uh, I think that they have the buyer protection program that they didn't have back then, and, they, and they've done some other things uh, to try to mitigate against it. Uh, but everything I've read says that consumer advocacy groups are still uh, looking at the, the issues with um, online auctions. Yes. Right, um, and, and the question was um, if, a, if a dealer has um, cars on their lot and they have Carfax or auto checks for all the cars, good, bad, yeah, indifferent, and there's some type of a discrepancy or a mistake, uh, and the customer comes back, uh, is the dealer still responsible? And in the cases that are currently being litigated, um, that's the theory that's out there. And then they come in a wide variety of fashions. Some are straight fraud where they say the dealer knew or should have known uh, that there was a problem with the vehicle and should have disclosed it. Others um, are claiming a negligence theory um, that the dealer, you know, misinspected the vehicle or failed to adequately determine whether or not there was a mileage discrepancy. Um, you know, I don't believe that there's a duty outside of the contract context between a car dealer and a buyer. I don't think you have the type of duty that arises. It's not a professional relationship. There's no duty of care that's owed. I mean, you can't sue. Uh, mechanics for negligence in Florida because they're not professionals. Uh, there's some cases out there along those lines. So I don't understand how there could be this duty, but, you know, people are claiming it. And, you know, the problem is people are buying cars and then they're looking at a Carfax. I'm, I'm defending one right now that's four years old. And when they took it to trade it in, uh, they took it to, um, uh, they took it to CarMax to have them buy the vehicle and they said this vehicle's been in an accident and they presented them with a Carfax. They've had the car for four years, never a problem, never an issue, and, and they're suing my client, saying they want all their money back. I mean, I, I've looked at an old CarMax agreement and they make no representations or warranties regarding the correctness or accuracy of their product, which I think, you know, the FTC wants to come down on dealers for not putting that in their ads. Why doesn't Carfax have to put that in their ad? You know, they're telling you to ask the dealer for Carfax, but then they give you the dealer a whole disclaimer that they're, there's not, it's not accurate, it may not be accurate, it may be problematic. Why don't they have to put that at the bottom of the screen? I mean, 
Um, you know, people were buying these Carfaxes and relying on them for a heavy investment. Um, I've tried to get multiple uh, plaintiffs' attorneys to add them as a defendant. Um, they never have, and none of the cases have been, you know, a large enough case where my clients wanted to go pick a fight with Carfax. I mean, they just don't. It, it, they're going to throw money, uh, you know, might as well set your money on fire. Uh, if you can settle with a plaintiff today for $10,000, you don't want to pick that fight and spend $10,000 fighting about it. Um, but I, I think it's going to become an issue uh, because more and more people are bringing those claims and more and more information is becoming available and people are looking at it more. Uh, you know, Cheryl mentioned during her presentation, nothing's secret anymore, and that's, that's very true about car histories. And you can find all kinds of information about prior cars and accidents, and, and not all of it's accurate. Uh, and there's no real mechanism to come back. The, the best thing that I've been able to do right now in these cases is I've been defending them by f trying to force the plaintiff's lawyers to bring in the people that report the information to Carfax, because it's pure hearsay. Under the rules of evidence, you can't take an out-of-court statement and have it come in for the truth of the matter asserted, is what it means. Um, essentially, what that means is if I, just because somebody says something doesn't make it true. And if Carfax's report says it's been in an accident, well, who gave that information to Carfax? Carfax doesn't create it. They're going to have to go back through, find the dealer that reported it. Okay, well, I want to depose the person who diagnosed the accident, because maybe they got it wrong. And if they can't present that information, then the Carfax shouldn't be admissible in evidence. Um, but the theories and, and the, the winning at the end of the day isn't necessarily the solution uh, because the claim is still going to be out there. It's still going to cost the dealer both money and aggravation. And I think everybody in this room probably knows 98% of lawsuits get settled because either you, know, you want to make them go away or, or a little bit of uh, money to the plaintiff uh, you know, makes your life easier. And I advocate my clients to do that all the time. I said, look, if you want somebody to tell you you're right, and spend a lot of money to do that, that's your decision, but from a business standpoint, cut this thing off, settle it. I mean, it's $2,000, make the guy go away. Well, I don't think I owe him, okay. Uh, you know, if you, you say that now, but you know, if, if they start digging and they find something, or they get a disgruntled sales guy, um, you know, that, those are awful witnesses. Angry salesmen that have been let go, always come back. They, you know, they, they uh, it's not a car case, but I'm, I'm defending a case uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale where a uh, uh, homeless guy was living in a storage uh, facility that, that I represent, the storage facility, and uh, he claims he was living there for eight years, and that everyone knew, and they gave him keys and called him the night manager, and he's suing my client for eight years of unpaid wages because he says he was the night manager. Uh, he went to overtime. He says he was there 10 hours a day, 365 days a year for eight years. Uh, <laughs> he... Uh, Obviously, he doesn't, he doesn't realize he's capped at three years, but even assuming that that's the case, it doesn't make him the night manager. Well, yesterday I got a letter that he's got statements from three former employees, and my client had gone in about eight months ago and cleaned house, and they found out this guy was living there, and that's when they booted him. Uh, so now all the former employees are coming forward and saying, yeah, we gave him keys, and yeah, we called him the night manager, and yeah, we thought he was getting paid. I, I mean, it's crazy. You know, the guy volunteered his services there so he could live in his storage unit, and now he wants to sue my client. Um, but the former employees are going to be, uh, you know, the thing that's going to kill you because the jury's going to sit there. They're going to hear three disinterested people tell their story, and they're going to say, they got no reason to lie. They're, they're, you know, I'm going to say, well, you got fired, you're unhappy, but, you know, it's just any substantiation he has is, is going to be a problem. So beware of the, uh, the former employees because they'll get you. Um, the forms, uh, GPS disclosure is going to be coming. Uh, I tell all my clients now, best practices, disclose it. You say, well, people will take it off. I say, well, you know, put in your contract if they take it off that, you know, it's a breach of the contract and you'll, you'll repossess the car if you can find it. Uh, you know, there's ways that you can get notification if they're being tampered with. Uh, it's just safer to do it that way. Um, you know, California may end up um, enacting some legislation that may require it. I think other states are going to follow suit. Um, I think the way that GPS information is ultimately utilized by third parties can be a problem. Um, you know, if I was uh, in a contentious divorce case, I don't do family law, but if I did and was in a contentious divorce case and I knew one of the spouse's vehicle was equipped with GPS, I'd be subpoenaing the GPS information. I want to know where that vehicle was. Maybe I get some good information out of it. So I think that there's, there's things that could come out of GPS that people uh, don't necessarily realize or understand. So if you're using it, just disclose it. Uh, single document versus multiple documents, I touched on that a few minutes ago. Uh, that's the Florida case that says your retail installment sales contract is the only agreement between the parties. 
Um, financing, that's the other area you're going to run into problems with. Whether you're using third-party finance companies, you're doing buy here, pay here, there's a lot of restrictions on what you can and can't do uh, with the information that the people give you during the application process. Uh, if third-party finance companies are involved, they generally uh, send out adverse action notices. If they're doing turndowns, you're covered by that. But the only way you can ensure that you're protected is to send out your own. Uh, it seems kind of crazy, but uh, most dealers in, in a lot of states have a finance license. So the safest thing to do is, is just send that out, unless you want to rely on the banks. It's not a defense to say, I thought the banks were going to do it, and they didn't. Uh, Risk-based pricing is going to be something uh, they're going to look at with more scrutiny. Uh, I recommend that all my clients just use the, the catch-all form that says, here's your credit score. It fits into these categories. And um, you, know, you use that with everyone. You don't, have to, you don't have to go on an individualized basis and explain to them uh, whether they were risk-based priced or not. Uh, credit applications, um, you know, that's technically your credit application is, is a form of a contract. There's a lot of stuff in credit applications that give you certain rights to do things. Uh, for example, you can present the credit application uh, to third parties for financing. You can contact employers. Um, I know a lot of my clients uh, that do buy here, pay here, utilize credit applications as a debt collection tool. Uh, you know, there's references on there. Um, a substantial number of credit applications indicate that the references can be contacted um, to determine creditworthiness. Well, once you finance that vehicle for the customer, you've determined their creditworthiness. So contacting uh, references off of a credit application after you've already, you know, two years later when they're late on a payment and saying, hey, can, you can't find the customers, so you're calling the references, I think that's an improper use of the credit application. I've only seen one case that's been brought that way, uh, but the application was bad. I mean, it said, you know, we can contact your references and your employer to verify employment and determine whether to extend you credit. And that was the limitation. Yes? I've added in there um, language in, in some of my clients' credit apps that say as long as there's a balance owed, if we extend you financing and we are unable to contact you, we can also contact the references to attempt to locate you uh, if we're unable to do so. Because really, under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, that's all you can do. I mean, I've got, uh, I've got uh, this nightmare of a case where this guy says his references were called every day for like 120 days. And if you look at the notes, his references were literally called every day for 120 days. And at one point, um, a manager puts in the notes, you know, we need to contact the references daily. <laughs> so that's in the collector's notes. Uh, you know, the other side's going to get those. Um, I don't know why you're contacting the references daily when the customer, and, and in the interim, they're, they're still, they know where the customer is. They're calling him at work too. He's just not paying them. So they're calling his references. They're, they're chasing him. Um, and, you know, he's going to sue them. He owes them 20 grand. He sued them for a fair debt collection suit. And, you know, the attorney wants like $85,000 on that one because he says he thinks it warrants punitives. That nobody sitting in a jury box is going to say, somebody stuck me down as a reference and now I'm being called 120 days in a row. Um, I think it's going to be a problem for that client. Now, I don't know if it's an $85,000 problem, but you know, the plaintiff's lawyer appears to think it is. So um, also look at your credit applications. I've, I've got a client that uh, was using a credit application, and I've got the example here. Um, it says, all of the information on this application is true, correct, and complete. Uh, this application for credit may be submitted by Centrex Capital Corp of Florida, the creditor, to various financial institutions for consideration, and it goes on. Um, my client's not Centrex Capital Corporation. I asked my client, who's Centrex Capital Corporation? I don't know. Where did you get this application? My forms vendor. Well, your forms vendor gave you an application that says Centrex Capital Corp on it. You don't know who that is, and the only person that has authority to send this application to anyone doesn't, has no relation to you. Uh, you know, so we've revised it. He was relying on somebody else to give him forms and never read them. I mean, I, I always ask this at, at these conferences. Have, have you ever read all your documents? I mean, it's amazing. You'll find typos and, uh, and other things. So I, if you're using forms, just read through them. Make sure they make sense. Make sure they're still accurate. Um, you know, a lot of people gather up uh, hodgepodges of forms that they like. You know, a friend of theirs says, oh, I use this and I use this form. Uh, by doing that over time, you can have contradicting forms. Uh, you can have mistakes like this. Um, I fixed it, so that's not an issue anymore. But uh, I was just, and it's, it's actually a, a, um, you know, a very 
uh, well-known and uh, high-profile dealer, and I was shocked that they didn't have an application like that. Um, spot delivery, uh, you know, that varies so much by state. Um, but my dealers in both Georgia and Florida are getting sued. In Georgia, you can, you can pretty much do it. In Florida, um, you can't anymore. Uh, so uh, if you've got conditional financing arranged, uh, there's a Florida decision, and it was based on an Ohio case. Uh, in Ohio, you can't do it either. Um, but it, what it said was you can't simultaneously bind the customer to a contract while disavowing any responsibility under the contract. It's not complete as to all essential terms, so therefore you're violating uh, Florida's finance laws and they awarded the customer the finance charge. Not the finance charge they actually paid, but the finance charge that's captioned on the retail installment sales contract because it's a penalty provision. Uh, earlier today, they talked about some of the legislation that's pending regarding um, recalls and notification duties. Um, you know, that's been proposed on multiple occasions. Who has an obligation to actually tell somebody uh, whether a car is subject to a recall? In fact, um, they talked about the federal act that was going to make it mandatory or prohibit you from selling a vehicle that is the subject of a recall. And, you know, one of the issues that's always arisen in these circumstances is how do you determine whether or not a vehicle is subject to a recall? You know, you need some type of a searchable database if you're going to mandate this. And it's got to be open and it's got to be public. And anybody that's got a car they want to sell needs to be able to go and check whether this particular car is subject to any recalls. Manufacturers do not want to do that. The reason being they don't want the number of recalls out there on their vehicles for public consumption. And, um, you know, there are n numerous times when there's not a real recall, but, you know, the manufacturer's aware of a problem, and if it's brought back, they'll first suggest that the customer participate in the payment of the repair, and then if that doesn't work, they'll say, well, let me talk to the regional people, and then they'll come back, and ultimately they'll agree to do the repair. Well, that's not going to be on any recall list, but it's clearly a defect in the vehicle. It's something the manufacturer's usually correcting uh, if it's brought back and called to their attention. Where would that fit in on this scale? Is that something that needs to be disclosed? I mean, you know, a lot of my uh, independent dealers know that. I mean, they know because they're buying a particular type of car, and they say, look, this, you know, Volvo SUV is subject to about, you know, three different recalls, and it's got four or five, they, they call them tickles, where you go back and they'll do it to accommodate the customer. Um, do they have to disclose that if they know that? Um, it's not a technical recall, but it's clearly a, manuf or a manufacturing defect. Negligence theories are coming up more and more on the sales of used cars that are subject to recalls. Um, you know, they're again getting back to do you owe the customers a duty? They're saying, well, you were negligent because if you would have taken this vehicle to um, a franchise dealer, they can hook it up to the computer and tell you immediately whether it's subject of any recalls. They've got the history, they've got all the information. Well, you know, that, that's, you know, an $80 or $70 diagnostic fee every time you do that. Uh, I understand from a business standpoint why it's not done. It's difficult to explain, though, in a, in a court case where, you know, a defect has happened in a vehicle that's hurt somebody pretty bad. And, you know, the defense is, well, I can't spend $80 on every vehicle to take it to a, um, a franchise dealer to have them look at it. It just doesn't sell well. Uh, so keep an eye on any legislation, whether it be state or federal, um, relating to duties to notify uh, on the recalls because uh, that's going to be – something that continues, and, and the more stories you hear, like the one they told today about the two people that were killed in the uh, rental car incident in California, uh, I just think you're going to get more and more public outcry about the recalls. Now, the next category that I like to call it is uh, post-deal considerations. And now you've sold the car, you've delivered it to the customer. Um, what happens now? Uh, number one, I tell all of my dealers, you need to designate someone you can trust to be your complaint repository. The first person the customer calls if they've got a problem is usually the sales guy. That's the guy they talk to, that's the guy they dealt with. Um, you know, that's the guy they're gonna reach out to. Well, if the sales guy has done something wrong, he's not gonna tell you. So you need to have, whether it's yourself, I mean, a lot of my, I'm like, look, if you've got a customer with a problem, you know, you put in every deal, we've got a little thing that says, if you have any problems whatsoever, you call this person or email, you know, the owner at this email address. And it's a private email address he's got set up simply for complaints. Um, you know, he doesn't get very many, but when one comes in, he's the first person to know about it. And then if he wants to delegate somebody else to deal with it, he does. But at least he's aware of the problem. 
and he has the opportunity to make the business decision as to whether or not uh, to settle it or to try to accommodate the customer. Privacy issues. Um, customer identifying information is always going to be a problem. You're going to have a lot of it, uh, both uh, active deals and uh, dead deals. You know, there is a case out there, uh, I think it was in Minnesota or Michigan, where uh, the garage door codes in a trade-in vehicle weren't deleted. Uh, the vehicle was traded, somebody researched the history of uh, the house uh, through public records as to the prior owner, showed up, popped the garage door open and, and robbed them and then they were caught. And um, you know, They tried to state a claim against the dealer for some type of a breach of a duty. Um, I don't think it got anywhere. But, uh, you know, simple considerations like that, you know, hey, I have the garage door codes been deleted. Uh, Bluetooth links, can somebody listen in to the phone conversations of, you know, the prior owner, is it going to connect? Um, you know, prior GPS, I mean, if you got to buy cars at auction, you know, there could be a GPS on that vehicle already. Um, you know, they've talked about, do you need to disclose GPS? Well, if you didn't put it on there, but you know there's a GPS on there, do you have to tell the customer that this vehicle has a GPS on it and somebody may know where you're at? Um, we had a customer that's currently in a dispute with one of the franchise dealers that I represent because their service records got left in the vehicle. Uh, they traded in the car and they brought their service records to show that it had been regularly serviced at, um, at the uh, Jiffy Lube or something like that. It had its regular oil changes. It was sold to a customer and the service records were left in the glove compartment. And then that person contacted uh, the prior customer and said, hey, I see you, you had an issue with the steering back in you know, 2008. Uh, that was worked on, and the customer who got the call flipped out. Said, you know, my address is on there, my phone number, this contact information, you violated my privacy rights. It was confidential information that I gave to you as part of the deal. Um, you know, what do you do with that? Dead deals, um, I don't know if anybody here has any uh, internal controls on those, but many times I'll do... Uh, compliance audits at dealerships and there'll be a box sitting on the floor that'll say dead deals. That's where they get thrown and then at the end of the month they're put away somewhere. Um, and there's an identity theft case in Florida that says a car dealer is absolutely liable for the theft of customer information by an employee because they put the employee in the position to do that. Um, and the number of people that come in and out of a dealership on a daily basis, having a box laying there that says dead deals is just waiting for somebody to, to help themselves to some customer information. Uh, there was, I want to say earlier this week or uh, late last week, uh, the FTC actually filed an action against the dealer in Georgia. Uh, it's the first FTC action against an auto dealer for Glam Leach Bliley violations relating to privacy. And what this dealer had done is they had set up a server uh, that was wireless and that was linked with other computers. Uh, it's a, a P2P server. I don't know what that means, I'm not a tech guy, but that was what the uh, FTC was looking at. Because it was that type of server, they said that there are statistics showing that that information is readily available to third parties, that they're easily hacked, um, people can inadvertently access the information because it's streamed somewhere and stored. So it charged the dealer with specific items. Number one, failing to assess the risks. Uh, failing to disclose or failing to adopt policies to prevent or limit unauthorized disclosure of information, uh, failure to prevent, detect, and investigate unauthorized access to personal information on its networks, failure to adequately train its employees because its employees didn't know about this problem, uh, failure to employ reasonable measures to respond to unauthorized access to personal information, and then interestingly, they failed to adequately describe in their privacy notices what was happening. And he said, you know, if you're going to put the information out there on this kind of server, you at least have to tell people about it, was the theory behind it. Now, the dealer settled, and they've entered into a consent degree with the FTC. But it's two things. Number one, it shows how technology can come back and be a problem when you're not expecting it to be. Uh, and then two, um, the FTC is now going to start trying to enforce the Graham Leach Bliley requirements. So, uh, you know, that, that's going to be uh, hot on their radar. And, you know, you've got these two agencies now. You've got FTC and you've got Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and then you've got the state AGs and they're all empowered to enforce the various provisions of the consumer uh, financial protection laws that were enacted. And each one's going to try to show that, you know, their enforcement is working and they're working hard to protect consumers and they want headlines. 
So I think as the election gets closer, you're going to see more and more of this because uh, these are political agencies and they want to justify their existence. And again, the closer you get, I think you're going to see more and more consumer protection actions filed against car dealers, against banks, um, against other uh, people that were involved in the Graham Leach Bliley Act uh, to justify to people in their minds why it is that these provisions were enacted. Uh, that's all I have for the presentation. If anybody has any questions uh, about any of the federal stuff, I'd be happy to talk about it. Okay, thanks.